This video is brought to you by the Ridge Wallet. More on them later. We like to exaggerate a lot, don't we? You can't just criticize a game, it has to be the worst thing ever that made me cry my brain out of my eyes out of sheer disappointment. Because there has to be a sense of progression, as if every new bad game is worse than the ones that preceded it. I'm not likely to discuss much of that today, but I do think there's plenty of mileage in discussing the worst games within otherwise competent franchises. That way, there's some tasty justified exaggeration as we unpack some of the most underwhelming games of all time, while also offering hopeful optimism that even the best around can make horrifying mistakes every once in a while. You might think that some franchises have a perfect hit rate, but even the best are prone to one or two slip-ups. Though specifically, I want to focus on franchises with one single standout bad game in there, because that way, the effect is way more significant. You can feel the weight of disappointment and failed expectations like a sack of cement. We're about to embark on a very exciting, deeply disappointing adventure, but before we do that, I feel like we need to load up on positive, hopeful energy, and thankfully, this video is sponsored by the Ridge Wallet, this sleek, very professionally designed wallet that fits in my back pocket a lot easier than my old FASA wallet. And apparently, this is so strong, it's chainsaw proof which is the kind of mental image that I didn't know that I needed, but I'm glad I have now, and now I can do my lumberjacking with no concern whatsoever. Most people are still using wallets designed decades ago, carrying around all sorts of receipts and crappy gift cards, and it's a bit strange that phones have got all stylish and streamlined, but wallets have stayed so archaic. The Ridge Wallet can hold up to 12 cards with extra room for cash, and with over 30 colours and styles to choose from, you're very likely to find something that appeals to you. Plus, with a lifetime warranty, you can buy just the one wallet and carry it around with you for as long as you want, with a 45-day return window for a full refund if you don't love it. Get 10% off today with free worldwide shipping and returns by going to ridge.com forward slash rabidluigi and using the code rabidluigi. That's ridge.com forward slash rabidluigi with the code rabidluigi. It's time to move away from Bulba's butt cheeks. Cool! Let's talk about some terrible video games. So everyone has their own definition of terrible, right? I feel like that needs underlining before we tackle this video properly, because with the internet's innate ability to stuff every sentence with hyperbole so that people will pay attention, it's easy to describe something below average as terrible. Why do you think people get riled up whenever a highly anticipated game is reviewed below an 8 out of 10? We're like pushy parents at a talent show, whenever we're even slightly let down, everything is terrible and bad and leave me alone! So I need you to trust me when I say that while Metroid is far from a perfect franchise, it has very rarely made any missteps that I would describe as terrible. Even with Federation Force from a few years back, that was more of a case of a wrong game at the wrong time after years of no new Metroid. But there's a key reason why there was such a big gap, and still is to this day. Something terrible happened. The extent to which I hate Metroid Other M has fluctuated over the years hasn't always been some kind of burning rage over this derailment of a beloved franchise, and more so a general irritation that this game exists and is currently the last Metroid game on a main console. Metroid Other M has a whole host of problems, ranging from a tone-deaf story that reduces a strong, silent character, to an overly emotional wreck who makes a series of awful decisions, to a unique gameplay style that forces the player to blister their thumbs in order to play it properly. This isn't Mario Party, this is supposed to be really simple and Metroid. The thing is that for all of Other M's issues, the overriding problem is that it was the worst thing that could have happened to the series at the worst possible time, since the conclusion of the Prime series left a slot open for a new type of Metroid game, and this is not it in the slightest. It's too experimental, at a time when Metroid needed some subtle alterations, and it is very jarring jumping from Metroid Prime 3 to Other M being released just three years later on the same console. Metroid has had low points, but this is the lowest point that it has yet to truly recover from, which makes Other M a game with consequences larger than its own boundaries. A full restoration may be in order. Metroid Other M being so bad and so far removed from what made previous Metroid games so much fun to play, just puts more pressure on Metroid Prime 4 if and when it comes out. 
it's more than just providing the world of a new Metroid game, it's righting the wrongs of Other M and giving people some confidence in this franchise again. So, plenty for the devs to work on in the next seven years or so. You should always fear franchise reboots. Sure, it's a great opportunity to potentially revive a franchise that's been dead for a long time, and I will never turn down a reboot for something like F-Zero or Banjo-Kazooie, but there is a danger, a real danger, that a developer may see this as a chance to completely overhaul this franchise and make it look virtually unrecognisable. You know, it might not be what you love, but maybe it will last a little bit longer this time. In a perfect world. Bomberman has been around for a long time. Since 1985, there have been more than 70 different games released on a variety of platforms, and looking down a list of all of them gives you a real sense of just how many games were made with a mostly very simple formula. I know the 3D games explored some new ideas, but Bomberman from the mid-80s isn't that far removed from Super Bomberman from 2017, and I'm impressed with this franchise's longevity and determination to keep running with the same kind of game. That being said, Konami are nothing if not consistently inconsistent, and I'm sure there was some kind of reason behind Bomberman Act Zero being this bizarrely realistic take on a cartoony aesthetic, but I can't work it out! Someone looked at this and thought it was a good idea. I hope they feel shame every day. This is a joke, right? Like those realistic renders of Mario or playing Dark Souls with a gun, this is more of the same, isn't it? That's the only way my head can piece together Bomberman Act Zero as a concept and as a fully realised video game that you can play and can watch other people play as Bomberman makes the jump from cute game about bombs to post-apocalyptic dystopian society where conflict is solved in the arena with explosives. Are you a man or are you a Bomberman? It's not like Act Zero was made by a smaller studio with a few too creative ideas for Bomberman since this is still the same Hudson Soft who put their names to dozens upon dozens of more traditional Bomberman games. The shift in tone and design does more than just look weird, because it also obscures a lot of the action, and it's only now that you appreciate how much stands out with Bomberman's colourful art style. This game was heavily panned by anyone who had the misfortune to play it, and unsurprisingly, Hudson Soft's strange little experiment started and ended at Act Zero. Bold of them to predict their Metacritic score in the title. There are quite a lot of weird sequels out there. To be more accurate, there's an interesting trend of second games in big franchises making huge changes from the original in order to, I don't know, keep the wheels spinning, I guess. Is it a fear of standing still and making a sequel that is just more of the same? Because here's a newsflash for you, that's not so bad. That being said, funky sequels like Zelda 2 and Super Mario Bros 2 are a far cry from the first games, but are still worth a play in order to see where the series could have gone if this change up in gameplay took off. Devil May Cry is a bit different, since its second game isn't too drastically different from the first, but it's like 5% different in every part of the game for it to feel like something very foreign, and not in a good way. You know, I can get on side with some of those other strange sequels because they're still fun, but Devil May Cry 2 is something altogether slower and way more boring. Yeah, boring, the complete antithesis of what this series of games has been since roughly the third, where Dante really got into his stride and started to steal every scene he showed up in. The Dante of Devil May Cry 2 is considerably more mellow, and while you can make an excuse that his personality wasn't as established as it is now, since he's still awkward and stilted and a bit too Resident evil in the first game, this doesn't make for a great comparison whichever way you shake it. Plus, it's a lot easier than your standard Devil May Cry adventure, with the only difficulty coming from enemies and bosses having way too much health, and their heads being replaced with a reminder that if you're enjoying this video and want to see more, then click subscribe and hit the bell for notifications of every new video. And I'm sorry, but this is not what I signed up for when I bought a sequel to the first Devil May Cry. This is a franchise that hasn't had a lot of games in it, and has kept most of them to a high level of quality. The only slight exception apart from DMC2 would be the 2013 reboot, which is definitely challenging to accept as a reboot, but it isn't functionally broken or painfully easy, so it's an easy pick to make. At least there's parts of DMC 2013 that are enjoyable. Devil May Cry 5 tells me that Capcom knows what they're doing with this franchise again, so we may never see a DMC game as bad as 2 again, but at least it has its own shitty place in history.
I'm sure the rent is cheap. If you clicked on this video having spent any decent amount of time watching my videos and getting a general feel for my taste in video games, you'll likely be able to piece together where this topic would eventually lead me. Maybe not all the way to number one, but if I spend long enough talking up the immense quality of Metal Gear games as shining lights of their genre and gaming as a whole, this franchise is sadly drawn to this topic like a moth to a flame. That's maybe the most poetic way that anyone has ever made comparisons relating to Metal Gear Survive being an irredeemable crock of shit, but you know, sometimes I get bored of wheeling off the same insults for the same couple of games. I can't let Metal Gear Survive slide, but at least I can have fun criticising it. Probably the only way I'm ever going to have fun with this thing. It's very important to remember the many different ways in which Metal Gear Survive is a catastrophic failure because I fear that we may have forgotten and moved on to some other kind of recent shitty game to get our fix and laugh at, but Metal Gear Survive is so bad, it fails at being a Metal Gear game, because it's nothing like them, but it's also a bad game in its own right that never gets the most out of its premise, or even the Fox engine that's recycled from MGS5. So it's a perfect candidate for this video. I'm not about to stand here and say that everything that Metal Gear has ever done has been wonderful, or even just decent, but it has always been to a high enough quality to not embarrass the IP. I mean, some of it has been a little out there, but it's all in service of some pretty spectacular video games. Metal Gear Survive, a game made without Hideo Kojima's involvement by repurposing a lot of assets from the last Metal Gear game he made with Konami, is a Frankenstein's monster of a video game. More the inherent tragedy and less the need for a companion to combat the loneliness. Survive deserves to be lonely for regurgitating tired tropes of no originality as part of a franchise that lived and breathed a life full of original concepts and innovation, all while Konami coats everything in a layer of hateful microtransactions that set you back $10 for a new save file. Considering the narrative that previous Metal Gear games have tackled with criticisms of rigid regimes and exploitation, Survive is an insult to everything that this series stands for and is the deepest of low points in a franchise that went so long without a true stinker. You know, if you don't count the patch of slots as a video game, but I've never played them, maybe they're really good patch of slots. Wouldn't be much of a victory though. For a large part of the scripting process behind this video, I've been debating how I should handle spin-off games to great franchises, because while this by no means should be a free pass for any kind of crap to sneak its way into a beloved series, I do still wonder how much thought I should put into it. As soon as you include spin-off games, you open the window to all sorts of terribly quirky games like the CDI Zelda games and Hotel Mario, but I think you can discount those via the context that those games represent a stranger, more volatile time within their own franchises. And also, I don't really feel like talking about the Philips CDI when Wii U games in 2015 were giving such putrid filth as Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival. I don't want to do this, and I know you don't want me to do this, but I regret to inform you that this must be done. The hesitancy comes from the fact that Amiibo Festival is a long way removed from anything even remotely Animal Crossing-like, and while that is a genuine complaint to have, it doesn't exactly try hard to be anything other than a cutesy party game. Animal Crossing didn't get a conventional game on the Wii U, and so there's definitely a sense of injustice that Amiibo Festival is the reluctant alternative, but the remarkable thing is just how dull and lifeless this game is from a perspective of potentially being a fun and enjoyable party game. In actuality, it's a bad party game, while also being, far and away, the worst thing that Animal Crossing has ever put its name to, and probably just a way for Nintendo to sell more of their amiibo cards. 2015 was a bad time for Nintendo games, and I don't think any other game underlines this more than Amiibo Festival. Just so devoid of life, it's like an empty husk of a game with some pretty makeup on. You would have need some ironclad optimism to see the Switch and Nintendo's renaissance coming after all of this, let alone an Animal Crossing game as good as New Horizons. Must have been short on ideas and full of cynicism in the office that day. This remember Luigi, and you might be sitting there thinking that Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival is harmless, and the fact that it's terrible, you know, it's not such a big deal. But in 2015, the reveal trailer offered hope at a new Animal Crossing game before what was revealed was anything but. And when the game eventually came out, it was revealed to be a lifeless party game, and it felt like Nintendo re really didn't care about the IP. 
And that just kind of damages the brand above all else. If it carries the name, it can potentially do massive damage. So, what topic would you like to see me cover next? Leave your suggestion in the comment on this video because I'll be taking the best ideas and making a poll on my community tab, which you can then vote on to decide what the next video is about. I'll be announcing the winner of the poll over on my Twitter, so make sure you follow me so you don't miss out. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.